Good morning. Welcome to Royal City Community Church. We're so glad that you could join us again today. We're going to be continuing the Bible study on the fruit of the Spirit. And last week, we were looking at the fruit of peace. So we're going to continue in that vein, finishing off that fruit today. Um, and before we move on next week with the, with the, uh, the fruit of long-suffering. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's just open up with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name. We just thank you for today. We thank you for just your continuing to be with us, Lord God. We thank you for your peace, that peace that passes all understanding, Lord God, that it will continue to guard our hearts and our minds. And Lord, we thank you for what you want to reveal to us today. Holy Spirit, we're just open to receive from you. Uh, we want uh, to cultivate this fruit in each one of our hearts and each one of our lives, Father God. So just, uh, God, do the work that you want to do. We thank you for that now. We Praise you and give you the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, so as I said, we were talking about the fruit of peace last week. And I want to go on today and discuss three ways in which we can cultivate that fruit of peace in our individual lives. So the first area is prayer. Vitally important. Prayer is one way to cultivate that fruit of peace. And I'd like you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Philippians chapter 4, and looking at verses 6 and 7. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. So prayer, right there, those verses tell us, is prayer produces the peace of God. Amen. There are those, however, who, who pray about situations, but are still troubled when they get up from their time of prayer. And the reason for this is that they neglect to include the condition for the prayer of peace, okay? Um, and that is, of course, thanksgiving. The peace will come during the praise and the worship and the expressions of appreciation that God has heard and answered in the prayer that has just been offered. Prayer and supplication alone will not bring peace to our hearts. But prayer and supplication with thanksgiving will open the way for that peace of God that will guard our hearts and minds as though, and this is really cool, as though they were encircled by a military garrison. Uh, Philippians, no, pardon me, Isaiah chapter 57, verse 19, you can mark that verse down. It says, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that's afar off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. Okay, so the fruit of the lips brings peace. Amen? I'll say that again. The fruit of the lips brings peace. And according to Hebrews 13, 15, that fruit is a continual sacrifice of praise. It says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Okay, now, the, the, Paul, he wrote, of course, we know that he wrote most of the New Testament. He reveals to us one way to give thanks, which is pleasing to God. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. And we will look at verses 14 through 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Looking at verses 14. 17. Okay, we'll just get ourselves over there. Thank you, Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Okay, so it says, For if I pray in a tongue, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing also with the understanding. Verse 16, Otherwise, if you, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? Verse 17, For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Okay, so believers who pray in tongues are praying with the Spirit. Verses 14 and 15 tell us that. Now, verse 15 differentiates between praying with the Spirit 
and praying with the understanding. According to verse 16, praying with the Spirit is a means uh, of giving thanks. Okay, and according to verse 17, it is the giving of thanks well. Therefore, as we make our prayers and supplications to God, with our understanding, we would do well to also offer them with our spirit. The result would be that we would experience more of the peace of God, and that peace would become more developed in our individual lives. We should practice this dual type of praying and worshiping so consistently that we will not consider any prayer or supplication fully complete unless it's, been, unless it's produced peace in our hearts. Amen? When that happens, then we can honestly and assuredly conclude our prayer by declaring, Amen, so be it. Now, there are two topics that believers are commanded to pray for by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Anyone, anyone who prays for these two things can be assured that they are offering up peace-producing prayers. Okay, now, the first one is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says, I exhort therefore, for first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving the thanks be made for all men. So it is possible that many of our prayers are hindered because we believers, as believers, we're not praying for what God commanded us to pray for in order, for, in order of his established priority. I got that out. And one reason many believers are not living in peaceful circumstances is because they have not been observing God's divine order that prayers be made, first of all, for all men. Now, all men is a very inclusive group. It would include those who do not agree with us. I know that's hard to believe that people do not agree with us, but yes, that will happen. As well as those who share our viewpoints and our opinions. Those who oppose and demean us, as well as those who esteem and admire us our enemies, and those who persecute us and despitefully use us, as well as our friends and our family members, those who cannot or will not return to love and respect, as well as those that do. And 1 Timothy 2.2 contains the second prayer that's very distinctive with a, with, a very, with a promised result of peace. It says for kings and for all that in authority. So we've got to pray for our government, amen? And what does it go on to say? For kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. See, so as we're obeying the word of the Lord uh, and, and place priority on praying not only for our, 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 our uh, political leaders, but also our spiritual leaders as well, then it is that point that we will cultivate this fruit of peace that will be manifested in all the circumstances that surround our daily lives. And our hearts will be more filled with peace because of our obedience to God's commandment. You know, and that, this truth is brought out even more so in Psalm 122. I'd like you to turn there, please. Psalm 122. Okay, book of Psalm 122. I'm going to get there eventually. Psalm 122 looking at verses 6 and 7. 122, verses 6 and 7. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen. That's vitally important, uh, especially in this day and age in which we're living in. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. Hallelujah. So it, it is unexplainable to the carnal mind, but it is a spiritual principle that those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the seat of their church and their government, will experience peace within their walls. And also physical Jerusalem as well. It's vitally important that we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, okay? But it's not the end of our obligation, responsibility. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel were instructed to pray for the, for the nation of Israel for, for Jerusalem. That is their own nation and their own people. And later, in the New Testament, this injunction was interpreted and modified by the Lord Jesus when he taught his followers. Matthew chapter 5, you can mark this verse down, Matthew chapter 5, verses 30, 43 through 45, says, You've heard that it's been said, Thou shalt love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. 
Now, the Greek word translated children in verse 45 is huios, and we've seen that word a number of times throughout this study so far. So our Lord commanded that we not only pray for the peace of our own nation and people and allies, but also that we pray for our enemies, political as well as spiritual. And the manner in which we Christians treat our enemies is one of the most important indicators of our sonship, our God-likeness. Uh, verses 45 through 48, for he makes his sun rise uh, on, the, on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So being like uh, our Heavenly Father produces peace in the hearts of us as his children, his sons, okay? And one way in which we will be like our Father is by praying for our enemies, just as even Jesus prayed for the ones that were crucifying him. John chapter 15, uh, verses 4 and 5, says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Which sort of segues right into the second um, way that we call, as we as believers cultivate the, this fruit of peace in our lives, is by abiding in Jesus. Abiding in Jesus. Okay, now the word to abide means to permanently dwell. To permanently dwell. To, to make a, a home stand. To continue. Okay, so abiding in Christ, therefore, does not mean coming in and going out of his presence its own, at our own, you know, personal convenience. It means to remain Remain continually in that presence, regardless of our feelings, regardless of our circumstances. You know, John, sorry, pardon me, Jesus said that those who abide in him would bring forth what? Much fruit. Much fruit. And you know what? Again, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. One of those fruit is peace. Amen? So these things, he says in John 16, 33, these things I've spoken to you that you, that in me you might have peace. You might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Amen. He tells us to rejoice because he has overcome the world. Okay, so there's much peace to be found in abiding in the Lord. Ultimately, we will find peace only in him. Only in him. It's by continually abiding in the presence of God that we will experience his peace being shed abroad in our hearts. Now, one definition of peace is a state of security, okay? And there is no greater sense, there's no greater sense of security to be found anywhere except in the presence of Jesus. Insecurity in the lives of believers is a direct result of not abiding in him. So if we're operating in, in a place of, of, of insecurity, we, we can right now point to that, the fact that we are probably not abiding in him the way that we need to be doing that. Therefore, the remedy for insecurity is abiding in his presence. Amen? Because only such an atmosphere is conducive to producing the fruit of peace. Luke chapter 22. Uh, let's turn there. Luke chapter 22. And we'll look at verses 21 through 23. Luke chapter 22, verses 21 through 23. Uh, it says, But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Verse 23. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Okay, so when Jesus announced to the 12 disciples that one of them would betray him, they revealed their insecurities by sorrowful, sorrowfully asking, Lord, is it I? Matthew 26, verse 22. And they've been with Jesus for three years, but they were not secure in the fact that they would be faithful to him. On well, the same respect, many of his disciples today reveal their insecurities when they're faced with the possibility that they might fall away if they're not careful. They may feel secure in the knowledge of their eternal salvation through such teaching as once saved, always saved, but their insecurities may manifest themselves through various attitudes and critical remarks they make when they hear teachings which deal with the need for maturing in the Lord 
or about being classified as an overcomer. And the reason that many believers religiously reject teachings that place individual responsibility on them is because they're continually asking themselves, will I be able to live up to what I'm supposed to be as a Christian? Well, in their own way, such people are just as insecure about their faithfulness to the Lord as were the 12 disciples who asked him, Lord, is it I? See, God wants us as his children to be so secure in him. And when we hear the word that the word of God, uh, whatever the word of God demands of us, and when, especially when the word of God demands a decision, there'll be no question whatsoever in our hearts and our minds, okay? That whether or not that we're going to overcome or not. He wants his sons, each one of us, okay, to be as sure of their faithfulness to him as he, as they are of his faithfulness to us, amen? He desires that they be so secure in their knowledge of him and his word and his will that when they're brought face to face with a spirit, you know, a spiritual crossroads, okay, we're not going to be asking ourselves, oh, will I be faithful? But rather we'll confidently state, praise God. I have received this truth from the Word of God, therefore I will do it. See, according to Luke 22, verse 24, the reason that the 12 disciples expressed insecurity when Jesus revealed that one of their number was a traitor was because they were still living for themselves, okay? Uh, and there was also a strife among them, which, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And the reason the disciples today are insecure. Many are still resisting the will of God for their lives because they've not died to self. As a result, they're troubled, they're insecure. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life, his life for my sake shall find it. See, believers find the freedom to live when they die to self because peace and security in Jesus comes only when self has been dethroned and Christ has been installed in his rightful place. True peace may be found when one reaches the point where he no longer resists the will of God. And we can determine how much we're resisting God by determining how many of the truths in the word we're obeying as they're revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. For example, God reveals to us that we need to, we need to fast more. Do we fast? See, as the Lord makes known to us that we need to be more diligent in prayer, do we begin to pray more? As we come to realize that there, there are bad habits in our lives we need to overcome, do we promptly set about to take dominion over them? As the word of God is being ministered and, and we're, a made, we're made aware of a new truth, okay, which affects our attitude and affects our behavior, do we squirm in our seat or do we pray, Lord, show me what I need to do to apply this truth to my own life. Those who are resisting God's will for their lives and in their and God's will for their lives and in their lives will struggle with such thoughts as, well, I can't do that. What will people think? What would it cost me? They will find peace, however, when they come to the place where obeying God's word is no longer a struggle, but a joy. See, as believers, we all have some type of, we, we have a type of ministry, all of us, whether large or small. And fear of failure is an indication of striving for self. It'll lead to, uh, to struggling with self-efforts to open doors that assure success. That's the reason so many ministries operate in the flesh. The people involved have a fear of failure, which leads to their producing an Ishmael. You know, of course, who Ishmael was. Ishmael was the child of the flesh to Abraham, a product of his fleshly effort that will later rise up and persecute their Isaacs, work performed solely by the Spirit of God. And of course, that's exactly what happened in the life of Abraham. His fear of failure caused him to rely on his own efforts, which produced Ishmael, his child of the flesh, which later rose up and persecuted Isaac, his child of the Spirit. As we who are involved in ministry admit that we were failures from the moment of our, of our birth, give up trusting in our own efforts, and allow God to be God, then we will find peace. Uh, Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in you. There is also the danger of striving for self in our personal lives. And this attitude indicated by the expressions of my family, my life, my possessions, my desires, indicates those individuals have not died to self. Those who truly died to self will obey the word of God regardless to the degree in which it conflicts with their lives. They will possess an attitude of prompt and joyful obedience. 
For example, when faced with fleshly desires, the truly obedient believer will be quick to respond to the spiritual admon ad admonition expressed by the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Believers who died to self will also rejoice in obeying Christ's uh, injunction found in Luke 9, verse 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself uh, and take up his cross daily and follow me. They will gladly take up their cross and follow him, for they know that by doing so, they will find peace. And that brings us to number three. Loving the word of the Lord is the third way in which believers may cultivate the fruit of peace in their individual lives. Uh, Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. To love the word of the Lord is to love the Lord himself, and vice versa. John chapter 14, verse 21. Jesus gave us an indicator by which we can measure the degree of our love for him. He said, He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he, he, is, he it is that loveth me. Therefore, love of the Lord is not indicated by remembering scripture verses or constantly studying the Bible or preaching the gospel to others or hungering after Bible teaching. The love of the Lord is indicated by keeping his words. John chapter 14, verses 23, 24 says, Jesus answered and said to them, If a man loves me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and will come to him and make our abode with him. Verse uh, 24 says, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. See, we believers may hear the word of the Lord, receive it, and learn it, but we will not receive peace until we have learned to keep it. Uh, Philippians 4.19 says, Those things which you've learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the peace of God shall be with you. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 17 and 18 says, Thus says the Lord, Thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way thou shalt go. O oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandment, then had thy peace been as a river, and in righteousness as the waves of the sea. See, we'll, we will experience the peace of God flowing like a river in our lives when we take heed to keep his word. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 promises peace to those who keep God's commandments. This is my son. Forget not my law, but let your heart keep my commandment. For length of days and long life and peace shall be added to you. See, believers who lack peace in their hearts should examine themselves to see if they're doing what they know to do of God's word. For it may be that they have allowed themselves to forget. In John chapter 14, uh, verse 27, Jesus admitted that the world has a type of peace to offer people. According to Revelation 6, 4, however, any semblance of peace will be taken from the earth. The world can only offer its inhabitants an unstable, short-lived, doomed substitute for true, lasting peace. See, the child of God, on the other hand, has promised peace in his house, 1 Kings 22, 17. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures here that you can look up. Uh, so, peace in his house, 1 Kings 22, 17. Peace in the land, Leviticus 26, 6. Peace in the grave, 2 Kings 22, 20. Peace and prosperity, 1 Samuel 25, 6. Peace in the end, Psalm 37, 37. Peace in his mind, Philippians 4, 7. Peace in his soul, Psalm 55, 18. Peace in his heart, again, Philippians 4, verse 7. Peace in abundance, Psalm 72, verse 7. Peace in his borders, Psalm 147, verse 4. Peace in his children, Isaiah 54, verse 13. Peace throughout eternity, uh, 1 Kings 2, 33. The child of God lives in peace, 2 Corinthians 13, 11. And, he, and as he lives, he lies down in peace, Psalm 4, verse 8. Sleeps in peace, again, Psalm 4, verse 8. Sows in peace, James 3, 18. Follows peace, Hebrews 12, 14. Comes in peace, Genesis 28, 21. Departs in peace, James 2, 16. Seeks peace, 1 Peter 3, 11. And preaches peace, Acts 10, 36. He, experience, he experiences perfect peace, Isaiah 26, 3, great peace, Psalm 119, 165, multiplied peace, 2 Peter 1, 2, peace within, Psalm 122, 8, peace with his enemies, Proverbs 16, 7, peace with his brethren, 1 Thessalonians 5, 13, peace with his God, Numbers 25, 12, 
and peace beyond understanding, Philippians 4, 7, all of which are made possible by the Prince of Peace, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And I'll close with this scripture this morning. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. Well, that was a lot of scripture that I threw at you this morning. I trust that you learned something from that today. Uh, God bless you. Uh, we're going to continue this uh, series next Sunday uh, by talking about the fruit of long suffering. So thank you for being here today. God bless you, and have a wonderful rest of the day.